Okay, uh, let's start. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's a pleasure uh, to, to have you all with us today in our workshop. Um, good afternoon, good morning, uh, or good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, I think most of our participants would be good afternoon, um, but just in case. Um, I'm very glad and delighted uh, to welcome you to this workshop in collaboration uh, with um, AGRIR, CAPSARC, uh, and uh, T20 Saudi Arabia. Uh, let me first uh, um, give uh, a brief about CAPSARC and what we, uh, what we do as a, as a think tank. Um, we were established about uh, 12 or 13 uh, years ago as a non-profit institution for independent research into global energy economics. Uh, we bring together an um, international um, group of experts, uh, researchers uh, from around the globe. We have about um, around 70 researchers, um, resident researchers, and about 25 non-resident researchers coming from nearly 20 nationalities. So diversity in opinion uh, matters uh, for, uh, for CAPSARC here uh, at the kingdom. Uh, we aim to develop economic framework uh, to achieve effective alignment uh, between energy policy objectives uh, and outcome. Uh, we also, uh, and this is part of our collaboration, we collaborate with leading international research centers, think tanks, and um, public policy organizations, as well as industrial and governmental institutions, uh, with the aim to share knowledge insight and analytical uh, framework. We do that by um, integrating energy into our research uh, into three or six main programs. These are macroeconomic and modeling, market and industrial development, political and decision science, electricity and energy transition, which is the subject of today's workshop, climate and environment, which we will be touching on uh, today as well. And last but not least, uh, transportation and urban infrastructure. CAPSARC is also a co-leading uh, institution for this year, um, Think20, which for short is T20, uh, is one of the eight engagement groups under the G20, which Saudi Arabia hosting this year and India will be hosting uh, in 2022. We look forward to collaborating with, um, to collaboration with think tanks uh, in India now and then and in between and after the uh, T20 um, events here in Saudi Arabia and, and in India. Um, this workshop, uh, the subject of the workshop is motivated by the need to identify uh, practical ways to facilitate energy transitions. So, irrespective of um, whether we are in developing or developed countries, the overarching issue, issue for the globe would be to identify the role of um, hydrocarbons in a decarbonized carbon future. The overall goal in this is to achieve the sustainable development goals of uh, access to affordable, clean, and efficient um, energy in parallel to aggressive actions to mitigate emissions from energy use. This is a challenging goal, uh, more so in large populated areas like in Asia and Africa that are yet to ensure full electricity and energy access. Managing this transition is critical for global energy sustainability and as well, it, it is being assessed by the T20 Saudi Arabia. And I'm glad that we have the lead co-chairs um, of the two task forces that tackle this challenge, which is climate change and environment. This task force is under the leadership of uh, Nur al-Mansouri who is presenting in the first session. And the second task force of T20 that looks into these issues is sustainable energy, water, and food systems, 
and this is under the leadership of um, uh, Hassel Motairi, who is presenting on the second session today. I'm glad to have them on board to let us know and present some of the policy recommendations that the T20 is going to present to the G20 uh, at the end of this year. So the questions that will be discussed today, um, I think, will be um, around how to design an, ener an energy pathway to achieve sustainable and energy, uh, sustainable energy systems, and what are the trans transnational support that many countries would need to, to apply uh, such a framework. And given the pandemic and the crisis and uncertainty we live in right now, the last session today will attempt to answer the question whether this pandemic is a speed breaker or an accelerator for such a, for such a transition. Uh, finally, I'm delighted that we, as I mentioned, uh, collaborating with Indian think tanks, and this follows on the steps of um, the Saudi-Indian partnerships, not only on research issues, but also on investment matters. We, we heard recently the Saudi ambassador to India announcing investments of potentially around 100 billion US dollar in, any, in areas of energy, refining, petrochemical, infrastructure, agriculture, minerals, and mining, to name few. We also, uh, at the end of last year, um, heard the announcement of India's Resilience Industries, which announced that the Saudi Aramco um, had acquired 20% stake in, in their chemical refining and fuel marketing arms uh, which is another example of the Saudi-India uh, partnership and, uh, and, and relationship. Another example is Saudi Aramco's commitment to a stake of 1.2 million barrel per day in downstream projects with two India's state-run refineries. These are, these are just examples of the important relationship between the kingdom and, um, and India. And um, I... I think it's only just a matter of time before we uh, embark into a further relationship with, uh, with research institutions, either under Saudi T20 uh, or India's T20 uh, in 2022. Uh, without further ado, uh, I will pass the mic to Dr. Rajat uh, Katria, a director and executive director uh, of um, a career. Uh, Dr. Rajat. The mic is yours. Thank you, Dr. Fahad al uh, And thank you for your kind words. And it's a pleasure for ICRE to collaborate with CAPSAR in this event. And as you said, I hope that we are able to not only collaborate today, but we can continue collaboration until Saudi remains a part of the Troika. And then further, when India hosts the G20, in 2022. So thank you very much for this collaboration. And since you've introduced the panel and the panelists so well, beautifully, uh, and the intellectual motivation for what we are about to do, let me say uh, just a couple of things about uh, ICREA and then a little bit about where India is with respect to its energy transition and how I think pandemic uh, COVID has impacted our, our move towards a clean energy transition. I'll say a few words about that, and then we'll pass on uh, to the moderator, Koshik, who will then handle the session. Uh, I was very impressed to know, I already know Capsal, but it's good to hear from you in person about the quality of the work and the quality of the engagement of Capsal uh, in such a wide range of issues, and I wish you all the best for the future. ICREA as well has been around since 1990. 1981, and we've been working uh, on policy-related issues and trying to empower the government based on knowledge and research uh, to have policy which is based on evidence. And we've been uh, largely in the areas of international trade and international economics, as our name suggests. But of late, we have transitioned into several areas, including climate change, including agriculture, including urbanization and clean energy transition. 
And we are very happy that we have, like you, a very large team of committed researchers, both in-house, as well as a very large network of internationally accredited researchers and scholars who work with us on several topics. I'm absolutely delighted that the topic today is managing energy transitions in developing countries. And that capsule, which is so well versed in this area, as you said, Dr. Alturki, uh, is co-hosting this event along with T20 Think in Saudi Arabia. And I extend my deep gratitude to you and to Koshi uh, for this event. Uh, some of you will recall that last year when ICLEAR had organized its annual G20 conference, uh, the G20 Secretariat of Saudi Arabia had helped us and collaborated with us. And we hope that, uh, as you said, we will continue to collaborate uh, with, with the G20 Secretariat, with T20, and with CAPSAR in the future. Uh, many of you will know that uh, ICLEAR itself is working with our Ministry of Finance, the Department of Economic Affairs, and we are supported by the UK government's DFID Department for International Development in that engagement. And we are working with the DEA on producing papers on a wide range of issues to help their engagement in G20. And the larger objective, of course, of our engagement is to help India prepare for its presidency in 2022, help the Ministry of Finance. And hopefully, some of the research that we'll do will be able to inform the agenda of 2022. Uh, you know, where India stands on energy transition today, I mean, if you look at the initial conditions of where India is, as Dr. Alturki, you said, that access is absolutely important. And there are several citizens, several people of India who yet have to get access to energy and access to clean energy. A lot of cooking is still, still done on biomass. A lot of coal is still used in our, in our primary energy production, fossil fuels still constitute a very large proportion of our primary energy production. Uh, given these facts, and even the plausible sort of scenarios that have been developed uh, by various institutions, including the IEA, seem to suggest that fossil fuels and coal will continue to form a very dominant part of India's uh, production uh, and energy mix. And given this situation, uh, it becomes a challenge of transition to a clean energy environment. Uh, and also given the fact that you know, uh, our policies that are in place today in India are, you know, those policies could be uh, sort of a lack of a clear framework of pricing. There are lots of subsidies, the markets are distorted. And one of the major uh, issues in our power sector is the fact that the discounts are heavily under debt, the distribution companies are heavily under debt, uh, and uh, any decarbonization plan of, of the power sector will have to depend upon making the distribution companies profitable and strong. Uh, and in fact, the stimulus package that was announced by the government uh, just last month uh, has provided 90,000 crores to the discount. Uh, to be able to come out of the debt situation that we are in. And hopefully there will be some other structural reform relating to pricing and subsidies that will happen alongside uh, to make that a reality. But unless the discounts are able to get out of, of debt, uh, decarbonization of the power sector uh, will be a tall problem for India. In fact, if one looks at the stimulus package, uh, there is mostly the focus is on the immediate requirements of creating jobs, supporting the DISCOB, supporting other industries so that we can prevent job losses. So what I think the pandemic has really done is that it's made the transition of India to a clean energy environment or a clean energy situation that much more complex. Uh, the, while the economic slowdown has had a huge and positive impact on the environment, and some of you will know that India's emissions are down four times uh, that uh, uh, for the first time in four decades. Uh, but at the same time, the question that is being asked is, you know, what happens to the auto companies, 
what happens to the power companies? Will they have a negative impact on, on passenger traffic, on freight mobility? And will that have eventually a ne negative impact or a deleterious impact on our transition to a clean energy uh, environment? So these are challenges that we are facing, but the government of India remains committed, especially in two sectors, which are responsible for very large emissions in India, both the power sector and the transport sector we remain, remain committed both on the supply side as well as on the production uh, of electric vehicles, on the production of solar panels. The government remains committed and has provided several incentives so that we can make in India, not only to transition to a clean energy environment, but also ensure uh, that we are able to create some of those jobs within the country, especially in the aftermath of the pandemic. So incorporating sustainability in our economic policy, especially post COVID, will mean uh, that we need to have in the transport sector, we need to have safe transport, clean and attractive transport. We'll probably have to have non-motorized transport along with uh, electric mobility. And we'll have to develop national strategies to adapt electric vehicles in the freight and passenger segments as well. In the power sectors, uh, the major opportunities that exist in India are moving towards distributed energy, moving towards renewable energy. Uh, we've ma made some progress on renewable energy, but our aspirations of reaching 500 gigawatts by 2030 uh, is a very high sort of ambition. And hopefully, if not achieving the exact target, we'll be able to come close to the target. Uh, so you know, both in terms of transport and power, and also on the behavioral side, trying to introduce energy efficiency remains a part of the portfolio of the government of India. And in several of these areas, which you will hear from the Indian panelists today, uh, we are also, ICRA is also producing research work to enable our government, uh, as I said, uh, to formulate evidence-based uh, policies to help the transition and facilitate that transition. So with these words, uh, let me once again profusely and profoundly thank you, Dr. Altuki Koshik, uh, for giving ICRID the opportunity to co-host this event, very important event, managing energy transition in, in developing economies. And I wish uh, all the panelists good luck, and I'm sure that we'll have a stimulating and wonderful show. Thank you very much, and back to you. Uh, thank you for your kind remarks, uh, uh, Dr. Rajat. Uh, and now, without further ado, we can pass to uh, Koshik, uh, who's going to moderate uh, the, the first session uh, and moderate the, the rest of the, of the event, I think, Koshik. Uh, so um, best of luck, and I look forward to a fruitful and interesting discussion uh, with attendees of uh, more than uh, 100. Uh, Mashallah. Um, Koshik, the mic is yours. Um, thank you, Fahad. Thank you, Rajat. Thank you for your kind introductory remarks and the steer that you have given. Some of the issues that you've listed will, of course, get covered during the discussion today. But of course, these are very, very complex challenges, and uh, hopefully, we get some steer around that. We have a very tight program, so I'll avoid kind of spending too much time. In any case, you'll get to see a lot of me on the screen today. I just start by noting that this is possibly one of the most gender diversified panels that we've seen in our webinars or I've been a part of in the last few months. I think both career as well as CAPSA can take great amount of credit for being able to manage such a fantastic set of talent, also such a fantastic set of talent that actually reflects quality that comes from uh, both these institutes as well as both these countries. Uh, just one housekeeping note, there is a question and answer button at the bottom, so I'd encourage everyone to use that. We already have a couple of questions uh, pop in, and I'd encourage everyone to kind of use that, to fill in your questions, and I'll try and bring in these questions as we get time for our discussions. Uh, our first session is discussion around the pathways to a clean fuel uh, energy future. And I think kind of the important thing to recognize here is that 
as diversity as well, as much as variety we have in terms of resource based market structures governance structures around the world we also need to have some set of common lessons that i think everyone can try and adopt so that move towards a low carbon future or a energy sustainable future is benefits from learning from across g20 members as well as other parts of the world which are not necessarily part of this discussion today our first speaker today is noura as fahad mentioned she is the chair of our climate change and environment task force on around t20 she is also a research fellow at capsar affiliate at the massachusetts institute of technology the doctoral degree from uh, university of london she has done a fair amount of work uh, on the issue of to carbon and carbon management sustainable energy use uh nora floor is yours you have about 10 minutes thank you very much kashik uh, hello everyone and good afternoon uh it's a pleasure for me to be here with you today and present to you the view from the t20 task force 2 um on climate change and environment around transition pathways towards a circular carbon economy um I'm sharing the slides and I hope you are all able to see it. So uh, the story of the uh, Saudi transition towards sustainability is perf perfectly summarized in this quote by His Royal Highness Prince Abdul Aziz bin Salman, our Saudi energy minister. Uh, and I'll read it out. I can assure you that Saudi Arabia will not only be the last producer, but Saudi Arabia will produce every molecule of hydrocarbon and it will put it to good use and it will be done in a most environmentally sound and more sustainable way i am willing to say that by 2050 we will be the last and the biggest producer of hydrocarbon and i think there is no better way to uh, lay out the story of uh, and the plan uh, of saudi arabia's transition towards sustainability than Uh, fo focusing on um, uh, the four R's of reduce, reuse, recycle, and remove, which we will be uh, exploring uh, in today's presentation. Um, so, uh, what is exactly the circular carbon economy? Uh, it stems from the circular economy, which uh, most people are aware of. Uh, that's based on the th famous three R's: reduce, reuse, and recycle with a systemic approach that really moves from the linear approach of use and dump or single use to a sustainable uh, production and consumption pattern the scope is on resource and material flows to really reduce the resource consumption as well as the waste the circular carbon economy you can see it as a step forward that focuses on uh, climate mitigation of all the options equally valuing all the options and um, adding a fourth r to the famous three r's of remove carbon and uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, the scope here uh, is on energy uh, and carbon flows uh, and the goal is to mitigate uh, greenhouse gas emissions so the saudi g20 presidency proposed circular carbon economy offers a new way of approaching a climate change mitigation Uh, that uh, implicitly values all the options and encourages all the efforts uh, to reduce carbon accumulation in the atmosphere. The diagram you see here, which is developed by Eric Williams, uh, shows the energy flows in orange and uh, CO2 flows in blue, uh, and shows how a circular carbon economy operates under the four R's. And we will be exploring some examples. Uh, these are the main components of the four R's. So under reduce. we have energy efficiency renewables nuclear these all reduce the carbon coming into the system uh reuse and recycle um are are a fairly the same uh, idea of uh, using carbon as a valuable input uh so reuse is reusing carbon such as in carbon utilization emissions to value and recycle is recycling carbon as it is such as in bioenergy finally remove is uh, pretty straightforward it's removing carbon from the system using technologies such as carbon capture and storage and we have hydrogen here across uh, more than one component as it tackles more than one component under uh, reducing uh, carbon and greenhouse gas emissions uh, 
So more specifically, um, Saudi Arabia has over 100 initiatives across the four R's, uh, and I'll be naming a few of them uh, under reduce, for instance, energy efficiency. Saudi Arabia has massive energy efficiency gains uh, through the Saudi Energy Efficiency Center, but also through uh, sustainability efforts that um, are driven in uh, many companies, including Saudi Aramco and Sabic, which we will see later. Um, Non-biomass renewables is also um, a big uh, plan as part of the um, uh, constantly changing energy mix. And, and um, the most recent announcement by His Royal Highness uh, is that renewables will, um, will be uh, at 50% of energy of electricity production by 2030. Uh, an ambitious and uh, uh, a great plan to reduce greenhouse gases and, and carbon dioxide. Nuclear power, similarly, the latest announcement is to have to start with two to three gigawatts and build it as the country sees fit. Fuel switching is another one of uh, reducing carbon by um, uh, expanding the use of uh, gas and electricity um, uh, all these examples provide uh, 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 reduce uh, mitigation options. Uh, under reuse uh, and uh, recycle, um, mostly under SABIC, which is pioneering the work in uh, utilizing uh, CO2 as a feedstock, and we'll see later um, uh, an example of that, um, including synthetic fuels, fertilizers and urea, methanol and chemicals, pol polymers and concrete. And under recycle, uh, the win-win uh, CO2 enhanced oil recovery for both the environment and um, the oil uh, um, industry, uh, supercritical CO2 application, concrete, uh, which also provide uh, a CO2 physical storage for years, and CO2 enhanced water recovery. Um, under remove, we have the natural sinks, including afforestation, as well as uh, nature-based solution in marine and oceans. Uh, bioenergy CCS, direct air capture with storage, and CO2 capture. Uh, these are just uh, only some, some examples of the um, act, many activities, over 100 uh, activities that Saudi Arabia is undertaking currently. Uh, here is an example of the world's largest green hydrogen project in NEOM, launched only next, uh, last week. Uh, air Product Chemicals Incorporation uh, signed an accord with uh, the Saudi uh, Bayes Aqua Power to produce uh, 650 tons of green hydrogen daily, daily uh, an investment uh, of $5 billion. Uh, this, of course, will create a dynamic new industry for Saudi Arabia, reducing CO2 emissions, promoting the circular economy, and also improve the health of both our people and our planet. Here is the world's largest CCUS plant in Sabic, in Jubail, specifically here in Saudi Arabia. Uh, it's the CO2 purification plant that utilizes, captures and purifies 500,000 metric tons uh, of CO2 from the production of um, ethylene and glycol every year. Uh, this, of course, um, will uh, meet environmental targets, climate targets, reduce waste, uh, to extract value from CO2, uh, as well as allow the industries to flourish and the economy to develop. Uh, here is another example from the beautiful Red Sea of Saudi Arabia. As you all know, oceans are amongst the greatest victims of climate change, but they are also amongst the greatest mitigators. So blue carbon economy is a nature-based solution for climate. And Saudi Arabia is focusing on that in all its uh, new giga projects where sustainability is a cornerstone, including Neom, Amala, and the Red Sea. Uh, KAUST, uh, the Saudi King Abdullah University for Science and Technology, is pioneering globally the research on blue carbon. There has been a study that was recently published and uh, won many awards uh, led by Professor Carlos Duarte that uh, found out that marine life can be rebuilt by 2050. And this is emphasized in, uh, in all the projects um, where uh, coastal ecosystems uh, support uh, critical aspect of the ecosystem, such as uh, water purification, protecting the coast as it's the first line of defense, protecting the local economy, the local uh, communities, uh, breeding habitats for fish, as well as most importantly, sequestering and safely storing naturally carbon in the form of blue carbon. Um, 
a last example from SABIC on resource and energy efficiency. Uh, uh, SABIC has utilized uh, CO2 as its feedstock. Uh, it increased to 3.3 million metric tons, which reduced material loss intensity by 29% using 2020 as a base year, mitigating greenhouse gas emissions, uh, in, uh, decreasing the intensity uh, by 7.8% and uh, energy intensity by 8.1% and water intensity by 11%. So we see how this holistic and integrated view where circular carbon economy um, has uh, uh, abundant uh, benefits across the sectors. Finally, I would like to highlight the importance of G20 as an effective tool for multilateralism in 2020 and beyond, but specifically for 2020 and as uh, um, due to the COVID-19 crisis, we saw the cancellation of Climate COP26 and Biodiversity COP15. So G20 must fill the gap in effective multilateralism. Uh, the G20 uh, presents an ideal forum for introducing and initiating the concept of CCE as part of the global COVID-19 recovery agenda, which mostly focuses on fossil fuel bailouts. So CCE will allow um, the uh, uh, transition of uh, fossil fuels to sustainability and to integrate CCE uh, um, uh, approaches across uh, all mitigation options. Uh, it will also help in supporting the development of carbon management technologies and extract further value from carbon rather than perceiving it uh, solely as a negative externality. Uh, some selective uh, T20 task force two key recommendations to the G20. The T20 calls um, on the G20 for a renewed commitment to climate change by embracing all mitigation options in order to progress towards circular, uh, sustainability. Uh, explore all options to mitigate greenhouse gases through the four R's of the circular carbon economy framework. Build, build back better through COVID-19 green sustainable economic stimulus packages by utilizing the CCE framework. Support innovations in carbon management technologies. Institutionalize and incentivize hard to abate industries, corporate wide uh, initiatives provide a platform for enables collaboration among nations and consolidate the efforts around uh, transitioning the hard to abate industries to sustainability. And finally, coordinate the rapid international ramp up of a new global low carbon hydrogen market. Thank you. Thank you, Nora, for that really comprehensive view of where the kingdom stands on several of these issues, as well as the importance that G20 and T20 have in this very remarkable year. Uh, I'll seamlessly move on to Sean. Uh, Sean is a senior fellow at Declare, a former colleague, uh, fantastic uh, international trade economist, a fantastic industrial economist. But I think very importantly, and I think this is where I'll make a pitch for the joint uh, for the book that Sean brought out last year on low carbon pathways to growth, where fortunately I had a chance to contribute to chapter as well. Uh, Sean, you have the floor. Ten minutes, please. We'll try and keep it to time so that we can at least have a couple of minutes for Q and A after this. Uh, thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Koshik. Um, Yes, I, can, I hope everybody can see my screen. Yes, okay. Uh, so I'll be talking briefly about India's challenges, energy challenges for India, transitioning to a low carbon economy. Uh, India is actually has a very complex situation, some of which has been articulated by Dr. Rajat Katuya in his opening remarks. There is increasing demand for energy, but as well as increasing emission. India's, um, it faces this trilemma of energy equity, sustain, uh, uh, security, and sustainability. And I'll be briefly talking about the policy recommendations uh, looking at the scenario in total. So um, the main thing for India is that, sorry, um, uh, the growth in primary energy consumption has been about 156%, expected to be 156% between 2017 and 2040. Its uh, share of global primary energy will jump from 6% to about 11%, with in, uh, industry being the strongest, uh, showing the strongest growth, followed by transport and non-combustion 
uh, it will account for more than a quarter of the global primary energy demand growth between this period. And a large part will be met through coal. And that is where the problem is. And uh, the panel that you can see, uh, the, the pie chart that you can see on the right hand side shows that as far as the uh, current consumption is concerned, energy and utilities consume about 66% of India's total uh, energy. Um, now, the problem is that uh, while the per capita emissions are about only a fourth of China's, it's uh, fossil fuel CO2 emissions and per capita emissions are expected to go grew about 80 to 50 and 55% between 20, uh, 2005 and 15, and are projected to grow by 30% and 15% to 2025. Now, all of these projections are, of course, in the pre-COVID days, so, so a lot of this will actually go out of the window, and we don't know which way <laughs> it could go anyway. Uh, the carbon intensity of consumption of energy, uh, consumption has surpassed that of China, uh, and it's expected that uh, it was in fact one third higher than China's by 2005. India coal's, uh, India's coal consumption has been increasing steadily and with that is the concomitant problem because a lot of the coal that we are using is actually imported. And uh, it means that there is, a, uh, there is an issue of technology lock-in for us. Um, India, so the trilemma that India faces is shown by the diagram, uh, the figure on the right, which shows that energy access is a problem still because uh, nearly um, it has yet to provide electricity to 304 million people and clean cooking fuel to near, near, nearly 500 people who are still dependent on biomass. The problem is that energy security. India is still heavily dependent on oil and gas as well as coal imports. And uh, the fossil fuel requirements, which re uh, comprise about nearly 90% of commercial primary energy supply, are increasingly being met by imports. So the question of en energy sustainability becomes very important. And it means that if energy, uh, India would actually cut down some fossil fuel consumption, it would actually meet the twin goals of energy security as well as sustainability. Now, uh, the trilemma of this energy policy comes through in this uh, World Energy Council's Trilemma Index tool, on which in India scores about 58 out of 100 on energy security, 48 out of 100 on energy equity, but on sustainability, it scores a low of 42. And this is where our main, um, one of the main problems lie as far as our energy transition is concerned. Um, and uh, to uh, do all this is improve the oil security as well as uh, many of the other issues. The government has prioritized reducing the oil imports and the hydrogen exploration, hydrocarbon exploration and licensing policy help has been built to progressively uh, build up uh, dedicated emergency oil stocks. And IEA has recommended reinforcing this oil energy response measures with other kinds of dedicated emergency stocks and improvements procedures, including demand restraint action and proper analysis of risks using oil disruption scenarios and capitalizing on international management. As far as energy sustainability is concerned, uh, while renew renewable energy has been increasing, uh, it is still dominated by coal, that which you can see, in fact, in the uh, graph on the right-hand side panel. And um, so, um, uh, natural gas and renewables both have been increasing, but there is still a way to go. Uh, the renewable energy consumption, in fact, surged from about uh, 20 uh, million uh, tons uh, in 2019 to about, it's expected to surge uh, to about 300 by 2040. And um, despite the growth in the renewables, coal continues to dominate by uh, accounting for about, uh, uh, at present it is about 50 to 60 percent, but it can actually go up to 80 percent of the energy mix in by 2040. So uh, the carbon intensity of the power grid, while it declined by 29, it is expected to decline by 29 percent in 2040. By 2040, at 58 uh, percent, it will remain the global average, and so will India will become, in fact, by these projections, the largest consumer of coal. And which is, of course, uh, it means a disaster as far as the CO2 emissions are concerned. And um, 
so the recommendations as far as the market and the pricing reforms are concerned, as far as IEA is concerned, is that we have to, um, the price signals have to be right, we have to rebalance the price, we have to implement cost-based electricity tariffs, we have to create functioning energy markets as well as a competitive wholesale power market. So what are the problems or the institutional challenges that India faces? Um, the, the coal, oil, gas, and nuclear policy, it is develop, developed and implemented at a federal level at the, state, at the central. And although a single ministry has been, a minister has been appointed uh, for power, coal, new, uh, new and renewable energy, the individual departments continue to exist at separate uh, And so there are, they work within their own silos. Electricity is a concurrent um, list uh, subject, which means that both the central and the state government have the power and jurisdictions over certain uh, elements of it. Each state had its own power ministries with related departments and companies. There are the state electricity regulatory commissions, which have jurisdiction over planning and promotion, as far as, the, as far also the tariff, et cetera, is concerned. And if you look at the number of national agencies, companies, organizations, the extremely complex schemes, there are, there are about 60 bodies, Coal India and Natural Gas Corporation, Oil India Limited, regulatory authorities are <coughs> CRC and the Petroleum and the Natural Gas uh, Regulatory Authority uh, Board. And there are these, the financial companies as well. So what, are the, uh, what does India need to do in some of these cases? As far as electricity pricing reforms, is concerned, uh, it, uh, it still continues to subsidize prices for electricity, uh, agriculture, and residential consumers. It needs to in, uh, enhance uh, um, the market reforms, electricity market reforms, because the energy markets are not functioning properly. The discoms are in uh, very poor health, and a lot of discoms face a lot of problems with poor pricing, weak co corporate governance, ailing infrastructure. Overwhelming state dominance, um, although part private participation has been allowed since 1990, uh, there is lack, uh, the public sector still dominates. What is needed is a joint vision and co common reform roadmap, taking all these agencies together and creating a cross-government framework for energy policy. Greater uh, coordination between institution, markets, infrastructure, etc., and knowledge sharing at all levels, of course, and Finally, of course, uh, higher pi private participation, and some of that has started, but uh, So the other kinds of in uh, help or uh, innovations that we need are as far as technology is concerned, some have been prescribed by the IEA, uh, but there are many, many, uh, there is a lot um, that we can still do, energy uh, uh, efficiency appliances, producing, uh, uh, electricity demand, attracting the best technologies in manufacturing sectors, particularly the small and medium industries, SMEs. Um, a lot can be done in the finance market. There is a big problem with that because um, the bond market, particularly as far as this uh, the sector is concerned, is very weak. Uh, the green um, kind of bonds have, some of them have been launched, but the products are very few and far. Debt financing options are there for some of the renewable projects, but then they limited, uh, remain limited. And um, while clean energy sector loans are now in, on the increase, but uh, they actually are driven by uh, economic factors. Uh, other kinds of things are the green investment banks, green asset, asset securities, and then also the, uh, following the Basel uh, norms. The global banking regulatory framework needs to be uh, basically, um, there needs to be a green factor or implementing a green factor by weighing them, uh, the bank's portfolio by uh, products which are, uh, by loans which are given to climate change related uh, loans. So all of this is a lot of things that have been happening, some very nascent, some very recent, but uh, still a long way to go. Now, summing up all this, India has actually given, um, as far as its NDC is concerned, it has pledged to reduce a lot of its emissions, and it is um, on its way to fulfilling its pledge. It has also aimed for a uh, reduction of, um, uh, basically, uh, the installed capacity of uh, nuclear and renewable by about 50 all this actually changes in lifestyle may be need needed and uh, so things like energy efficiency not only of industries but also for the commercial uh, for the residential sector and appliances etc would be very important 
All this would of course require, require finance and technology and some of which I have spoken about in my presentation. But most and uh, uh, importantly, what we need is innovative ways of thinking and participation of every individual in this citizen or, or, and citizen of this country to make India into a, a low carbon, um, a low carbon energy sector. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sean. Thank you, Nora, for this really rich and comprehensive discussion. Uh, this is truly one of those issues that one can't uh, quite get a grip on within a half an hour session, but you guys, I mean, you have done very, very well. Thank you so much for this. I'm going to exercise my moderator privileges, extend this session by another couple of minutes, just for us to be able to respond to some of the questions that are coming in, but just again for just two minutes. So uh, let's have take a break. And Nora, two things that have kind of come up in the Q&A box for you. One, uh, would you talk to what is the emissions to value component under reuse? Also, while you're at it, there's also a question about who, who is going to pay for uh, circular carbon economy? Thank you, Kaushik, and thank you for the questions, everyone. Um, so for the, for the first questions on emissions to value, these are the associated emissions. Um, Saudi Arabia has a long history of uh, environmental stewardship uh, prior to 1970, Saudi Arabia has uh, burned associated gas uh, and since 1970 has launched a master gas system that utilizes uh, this gas and um, this is a successful story of uh, uh, really the foundation of SABIC, which today is a pioneer uh, and the, the largest plastic company in the world. So this uh, actually uh, is the history of how uh, the petrochemical industry came to existence in Saudi Arabia and in its um, uh, in, in that journey has avoided around a hundred million CO2 uh, uh, tons of CO2 annually since 1970 and a lot has been written about that and there's actually the oil and gas initiative which uh, Saudi Arabia has founded uh, which uh, specifically focuses on that. On the second question on who finances CCE, um, I think this is a, um, a general question and it, it's a case by case scenario. Um, uh, CCE is the same as the transitioning toward environmental sustainability. So it's as if you are asking who's gonna pay for, the, for uh, taking care of our planet and taking care of our environment. But I would say um, uh, more technically, uh, parties to the Paris Agreement can utilize Article, Article 6 market mechanism, which offers ways to uh, trade carbon uh, uh, and offset carbon. I hope this answers your questions. Thank you. Thanks, Nora. I'm sure this discussion will go on endlessly and for after this workshop as well. Sean, can I if I flip this back to you? Uh, the dominance of fossil fuels, particularly coal in India's energy future going until who knows how long. Uma has asked, what's, what are the clean energy options for India until 2030? Yeah, so um, India has actually, um, you know, both solar as well as wind, and uh, not to say, um, uh, India has strongly deployed both. In fact, it is, India is on its uh, way to meet both the, you know, the, uh, the uh, commitments that it had made in the, in the Paris both solar and wind is concerned, it is well on to meet it. As you well know, is the solar tariff uh, prices have also been coming down very high, um, very sharply in India. Uh, only the the only concern that seems to be there is that the manufacturing, the solar panels, etc. A lot of the parts are imported and imported from China. So the entire value chain of the you know the panels, etc. is not there in the country. Neither do we have the silicon necessary to do that. So there is, uh, there are those those kinds of bottlenecks are there, but I'm sure uh, there are ways to find alternatives, uh, and we are in fact doing a lot to ma manufacture uh, those equipment in the country. So we are well, well, uh, well to uh, on our way to meet those our targets. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Nora. Uh, let's move on to our second session. As I said, we're running a bit late, but I'm sure kind of the richness of this discussion merits a few extra minutes. Uh, Let's talk about what kind of governance structures, multilateral, bilateral, as well as transnational, would help facilitate such a transition that uh, Nora and Sean described earlier. 
uh, what are the mechanisms by way of which co-learning is possible? What is the, what are the mechanisms by way of which joint activities between nations and entities within nations are possible? First speaker that we have for this particular session is Hossa. Hossa, uh, my colleague here in CAPSAC, is the Sherpa for T20. Uh, she's also a research fellow here with an extensive experience in both modeling as well as policy relevant work. Uh, Asa, if I can hand over the floor to you for another 10 minutes. Thank you very much, Koshik. Um, let me share my uh, slide first. Uh, can you see it, Koshik? Yes. Very good. Uh, thank you very much again. And um, it is actually a pleasure to join a colleague here. Uh, can you hear me also? Because I notice there's some connection. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And um, it is a, pl a pleasure to be here with, uh, with colleagues and to present uh, on the uh, T20 task force on sustainable energy, food and water systems. Uh, T20 Saudi Arabia has introduced uh, this new task force. Um, uh, this is an important topic for the G20, um, uh, for the Saudi G20 presidency, uh, which has the aim of safeguarding the planet by fostering collective efforts to protect our global commons. This aim is particularly aligned with the priorities of the task force, since it includes promoting cleaner and more sustainable energy systems and affordable energy access and promoting water sustainability and reduce food loss and waste. I will start uh, first by giving an overview of the task force. And um, th this task force actually covers uh, challenges that are important for the world, but I will put an emphasis on the MENA region. Uh, and also I will summarize some of the task force recommendations. So the task force, um, in total, uh, we, uh, we received um, our fin uh, final policy briefs produced under the task force, are around 19 policy briefs uh, in different categories, as you see. Um, and they are co-authored by 104 authors representing 57 think tanks, universities, research centers, and organizations across the globe. Um, under the, uh, or by the uh, uh, 19 policy briefs, 72 recommendations um, have been produced. And many of these recommendations have means of implementation, um, which were detailed in the policy brief. Um, the, uh, as you know, um, all civilization need energy, water, and food to prosper. Unfortunately, many people still do not have sufficient access to these resources. At the same time, both production and consumption of resource need to be more sustainable, as mentioned in the, the, in the discussion. Transitions are already happening and it might accelerate in the future, although the pace of transition is uncertain. And this could disproportionately affect economies that heavily depend on fossil fuel resource have a scarce water resource or import for uh, food as um, it is the case for the MENA region. So if we look at this um, map here, uh, MENA uh, region is a water stressed region and it's this case also for India. Uh, the MENA region is one of the world's uh, driest region. It includes 12 of the uh, world 14 most water stressed countries. Underground water use exceeds renewal due to overpumping, which is fueled by subsidized energy in some countries. And this, uh, of course, is not sustainable. And policies for uh, food self-sufficiency, such as uh, production subsidized, have accelerated the depletion of underground water. In GCC countries, um, water security issue has been addressed by resorting to water desalination. And 40% of world desalination actually uh, capacity is in the G, uh, GCC country. But this is actually is an energy intensive solution and it's not sustainable. The other characteristic 
of the MENA region, it is a food importing region. And the growing dependency of the region in food imports and the resulting exposure to international price volatility are major challenges to food sustainability, um, especially for cereals and meat. And the final characteristic uh, related to this task force is that MENA is an energy exporting um, region. It is the largest energy exporter. Uh, several many, uh, MENA countries are fossil fuel rich. Oil and natural gas contribute to a large part of their GDP. And in the face of uncertainty surrounding the global energy transition, the diversification of national economies is the ultimate solution. So there are several uh, critical elements that we need to keep in mind for successful uh, energy transitions. The first is the, that energy water food nexus is an important topic, especially, but not only for the MENA region. But unfortunately, this topic is often overlooked uh, when addressing energy transitions. Uh, interaction among energy water and food sectors are numerous. Um, desalination is energy turned into water. Producing electricity with thermal power plant requires water for cooling. Biodiesel and ethanol compete with food, um, just to mention a few. The second uh, critical topic that should be considered in the broader context of energy transitions is the stability in international energy markets, which is critical to promote adequate investment in infrastructure so that economic activity can be sustained. And as I mentioned previously, government should leverage all available resource and technologies options in order to reach carbon neutrality while minimizing stranded assets within an orderly energy transition. And on the next uh, slide, I will summarize a few recommendations related to the three topics. The first topic is energy security and market stability. And we have several policy briefs related to this topic. And the, the main recommendations emphasize, uh, first, to create a baseline of timely objective data on the production, consumption, and trade of new energy form, uh, forms and key mineral inputs, and share best practices for extraction and recovery of key minerals. Also to preserve institutional mechanism that minimize market volatility, such as spare production capacity and government uh, inter, in, uh, inventories, while taking steps to in, uh, that encourage building storage capacity and find ways to protect um, international trade. Uh, the second recommendation is to leverage dialogue between consumers and producers to promote more transparent markets and freer trade, and to develop a long-term approach to market stability through enhancing cooperation between existing energy institutions, such as IAA, IRENA, OPEC, IAF. And the final recommendation is to leverage the circular carbon economy framework to reduce the uncertainty of energy transitions. Uh, the second recommendations related to the nexus, water, energy, food nexus, is, uh, as you know, that regulatory frameworks, organization, and policymakers must adopt a holistic approach that considers the synergy and trade-offs arising from linkages between water, food, and energy. And focusing on sector-specific challenges is not always um, efficient. And the first recommendation is to promote policy that support, support safe urban water re reuse and water saving technologies in agriculture. And specifically to develop a diverse, uh, diversified portfolio of supply side solutions, including wastewater recycling and reuse, um, increase in desalination, but with energy efficient uh, technologies such as reverse osmosis, and instead of using thermal desalination as the, what is happening uh, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, further, improve agriculture water efficiency, uh, for instance, by modernizing irrigation systems when it's needed. And the second recommendation is to create a working group to assess the full costs and benefits of desalination and to create a forum for nex nexus governance best practice to bridge the nexus institution institutional framework gap. 
and also to form R&D teams to promote Nexus technology implementation and incentivize the private sector to bridge the Nexus investment gap. And to provide public support to increase electricity access in remote rural areas of, uh, of Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And finally, and related to food, is to look at trade policy and, and that should prioritize food imports for water in, uh, intensive food sourced from water abundant region. And the final uh, topic that uh, related to what we are talking about today is uh, energy transitions. And uh, as you know, the uh, larger scale investment in a, a abatement technology such as energy efficiency in building and industries and hydrogen and carbon capture, uh, capture utilization and storage need to be included in plans to re-energize re economies following what is happening in COVID-19 uh, or the recession that had following COVID-19. Also to promote fit for purpose technology solution across oil and gas supply chain to reach near zero flaring targets, to identify and remove non-market barriers that might hinder the horizontal integration of electricity and transportation, and to de-risk de hydrogen implementation and enable um, at scale implementation in an adaptive way. Uh, this will reduce cost and enable the market to choose adequate energy solutions for sustainable future. And to support innovations in carbon management technologies, including but not limited to um, negative emission technologies such as direct um, air capture and CCUS. Um, carbon management initiatives must be integrated in post-COVID-19 uh, related um, stimulus package, as mentioned by uh, Nora, and also to address uh, simultaneously address social envir and uh, environmental concerns while st uh, stimulating economic prosperity for a more inclusive and sustainable future. And this will conclude my talk. Thank you very much. Back to you, Kosh. Thank you, Hossa, for this fantastic overview of what the task force on energy, water, and food is working on. Uh, I can now hand it over to Amrita. Amrita is, again, a former colleague, uh, a senior fellow at career with a wide-ranging experience on energy, environment, modeling, as well as policy work, now on climate change as well. Amrita, the floor is yours for 10 minutes. Yeah. Yeah, I hope you can see my screen. Yeah, um, so a very good afternoon to everybody. Uh, I am in a bit of a dilemma because some of the work that I was going to talk about uh, has already been talked about by previous speakers, but at the risk of repeating some of the learnings from previous uh, presentations, um, I would present our overview. So um, Dr. Kathuria, in his initial remarks, he talked about the fact that uh, ICRIA is lending research support to the Ministry of Finance with respect to uh, G20 negotiations and what India's stand uh, should be or needs to be. So I personally uh, am working on the Energy Sustainability Working Group. And within that, in the presentation today, since we're talking about uh, the food, energy, water nexus, and also the elements of uh, market stability. So some of the work that we are currently doing for the ministry, as well as some of uh, what has essentially uh, happened in G20 negotiations over a period of time. So both of these aspects I will be touching on as part of my presentation. So uh, what is market stabi uh, uh, stability? So uh, this is pretty common. So as far as we know, most of the instability is caused due to two types of factors. It could be either price driven or supply driven. So price uh, volatility comes out of uh, maybe manipulations or speculations by different uh, market participants or because of ma uh, macroeconomic policies of maybe major buying or selling countries. Alternatively, supply side instability could be because of geopolitical situations and, uh, market, uh, and uh, natural disasters. And uh, since countries are heavily dependent on the imports of fossil fuels, this affects them adversely. 
uh, with respect to G20 initiatives, so there is this very uh, strong understanding right at the beginning that uh, there was an emphasis on well-functioning, open, competitive, efficient, stable, and transparent energy markets to promote energy trade and investment. And that has been uh, referred to by my previous speaker as well. So uh, within the uh, G20 negotiations, um, some of the, I think, uh, measures that have been talked about over time have been all about reducing price volatility, phasing out of inefficient fossil fuel subsidies and promoting transparency of markets, etc. So if we could just simply put these two initiatives into two bins. So we see this sort of uh, work on G20 to be happening along the lines of bin one, which has all the initiatives with respect to data, uh, greater data availability, which is the Jodi initiative. I'll be talking about it in my next slide. Uh, the global infrastructure hub, which is also all about transparency of data and bringing in the pipeline of bankable uh, infrastructure projects, etc. And the second bin is with respect to work that is being done to ensure greater green investments happening. So we have, uh, again, a green finance study group and then which later converted to sustainable finance study group. And you have a lot of different measures to include more private finance, etc. So talking about Jodi, so Jodi is a very important initiative, I feel. And uh, while uh, as far back as 2006, G20 leaders formally expressed the support, but the work continues on. And that is, I think, a very rich data source. So uh, when it started, Jodi, uh, so Jodi stands for Joint Organizations Data Initiative. So the, they aimed at promoting transparency and to address the, uh, and to address the increasing energy market uh, in uncertainty. So, which was stemming largely from lack of reliable collection and compilation of data. So, while they started off with uh, Jodi Oil, so slowly they uh, moved on to Jodi Gas, and I think Jodi Coal is also under works. While the Jodi initiative was largely with respect to transparency of markets, etc., uh, G20 under its helm of affairs also talked about greater disclosures of data transparency among corporates. So we had uh, uh, G, uh, the G20 forum. So it had uh, something called financial stability board, which was to insulate financial markets from risks, uh, uh, from risks which included climate risks and to ensure the stability. So as part of it, there was this task force on climate related financial disclosures that was set up in 2015 for voluntary and consistent risk related disclosures by company so uh, so this they try to ensure that you get reliable data on assessment pricing and management of climate related risks similarly there was also initiatives that was done uh, on um, uh, how do you get more capacity together so that people get people get to know how to compile data and there there were a lot of initiatives towards this transparency side of things as regards the green finance initiative, so uh, green finance, I think, started off uh, with the Green Growth uh, Action Alliance in 2012 summit, but then it kept on increasing the scope, kept on increasing till it uh, uh, went on and transformed into the G20 Green Finance Study Group. And it had a lot of asks, so it tried to identify the barriers, how do you attract private capital, it tried to share case studies and knowledge and promote cross-border investments. And uh, uh, to a large extent, uh, this has been uh, successful in trying to spearhead this sort of uh, transition towards green financing. And this later on, rather than green, the argument given was that it needs to have greater or more number of characteristics because adaptation, etc., that is also important. So we had the sustainable finance study group. So uh, that was set up after 2018 Argentina summit. Now talking about India's initiative. So uh, India's NDC commitments, Shaun has already talked about in her presentation, but uh, since uh, the later part of my uh, presentation, we talk about uh, the food, energy, water nexus as regards uh, this ap uh, applied in an Indian sort of a case study. So it merits that I repeat some of this. So because this will be referred to later as well. So. Uh, uh, this commitments with respect to emission intensity reduction, 
there are commitments with respect to cumulative electric power install capacity that needs to be 40 percent there are commitments with respect to uh, carbon sinks being created by forest and tree cover but it is interesting that with respect to adaptation so adaptation would cover a large part of uh, maybe the food part as well as the water part so for that we don't have a uh, sort of target, it is more like a normative aim where we are saying that we need to better adapt to climate change by increasing investments in development programs. So the idea here that uh, the government is uh, uh, putting forth is that it continues to believe that the large part of adaptation finance will continue to be publicly sourced. And while there is a dire need for adaptation, we are not setting a target so it will be as per requirement and in terms of preliminary estimates we get a, a total amount or a first estimate or preliminary estimate we uh, uh, the NDC document talks about USD 2.5 trillion of requirement so uh, this graph or this figure that I show in front of you so that very nicely puts forth the food energy water nexus in a pictorial format so what you're saying on the upper right hand side you talk about all the risks that are there so we start off with uh, uh, the seasonality and the general price and market shocks that maybe the agriculture sector has to face but there are additional risk elements from the few integration or the food energy water nexus integration which transmits greater risks so there are risks of electricity there are risks with respect to water so that just increase variability a lot of in a lot of ways so what needs to be done so there are strategies that uh, uh, can be put in place so either we could go actually it needs to be a combination so on in one direction we need to talk about technologies that help you uh, sort of ameliorate this sort of condition and also we need to talk about policy and development initiatives that together with the technology raise finances and implement these things on, on the ground uh, a very critical and important step in this entire storyline is the need for investment and the need for finance that i will be talking about in my later slides and uh, the need for finance and the link to market stability uh, uh, needs to be it's, it's it's already established and i think the t20 some of the recommendations that the t20 uh, also put forth tries to bridge this sort of gap uh, hello yeah uh, so uh, talking about uh, uh, firstly we talk about the technology and the policy push that i talked about so uh, in india a large part of the uh, population depends on agriculture for its livelihood it is very critical for the country's overall development and there are a lot of interdependency between agriculture water and energy sectors which lead to risk transmission so there are some initiatives that have been taken up both from the technological side as well as the policy side that seeks to improve this condition so one of them is this entire uh, move towards solar pump sets and there is a very a uh, critical government program called Kusum, which seeks to uh, get this, uh, the, or increase the offtake of solar pump sets. Uh, on the second, uh, on the other side, we also have programs such as uh, the Pradhan Mantri Krishi Sicha Yojana, that is essentially uh, for irrigation uh, projects, which uh, focuses uh, to an extent, so there is this per drop more crop sort of a catchphrase, which focuses on micro irrigation like sprinkler, pivots, drip, rain gardens, etc., which try and reduce the sort of uh, water intensity of uh, production. And you also have a lot of public uh, money being devoted towards popularizing this. The third aspect that we can talk about from the uh, food energy water nexus would be this entire policy program on biofuels. So while initially biofuels, to a large extent, we were trying to look at the first generation biofuels and there was a policy on blending of biofuels in diesel as well as petrol but increasingly there is this consciousness that there is this nexus that exists and there needs to be a uh, greater focus the r d focus on second and third generation biofuels in which this sort of a competition between food and energy wouldn't happen as regards the institutional structure and finance which is uh, a large part of the work that we are currently doing uh, in our uh, d20 interactions so um, uh, there are even within the currently existing policy purview, there are uh, elements that are being picked up and that try and uh, I think 
improve this sort of nexus built up. So, uh, such as uh, I would, uh, for example, I've given some examples. So, for example, we talk about the Manrega scheme, which is the uh, Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act. So, in that, while this is provides employment to people uh, for different activities uh, with respect to rural development. So we have a very important component of watershed management that has been incorporated that looks at conservation of water in rural areas. Similarly, we have NABARD, so, uh, which has the NA, which is essentially uh, managing the national adaptation for climate change. And it also has come out with climate change funds, which all are directed towards projects that are trying to reduce water consumption. Then there is a micro irrigation funds as well. So uh, just to outline this thing that even on the ground, what we see is largely it is public money that is being devoted to solve these FEW crisis that is happening. So be it water, be it agriculture. So uh, it is largely public money. And in fact, uh, as part of the Ministry of Finance, there is a dedicated uh, division called Climate Change Finance Unit that has been set up to provide uh, or to advise the government on how uh, climate financing needs to be increased in the country. Now this comes to what our conclusions or our takes are. So as regards financing, because financing is a very important part. Now you have to understand that most of these projects that we're talking about are going to be very small and dispersed, so geographically dispersed. So to get them all together, so be it in terms of micro irrigation projects, be in terms of maybe uh, farmers going biofuels, be in terms of other such projects. So these are going to be very micro. So how do we get them all together? So uh, the first option that we can think of is green bonds. So I think green bonds was alluded to by Shaun in her presentation as well. So I agree green bonds, while it had a very spectacular start, uh, and in fact, if numbers um, are correct, so then India is the second largest emerging green bond markets after China. And it has a, uh, uh, it had found a very good market, but we are slowly seeing that uh, demand for green bonds are uh, reducing. So maybe I think when the economic condition improves a bit, we'll see a resurgence uh, in this instrument. But right now, uh, uh, things look a bit grim. But from the institutional point of view, SEBI, which looks at, which is essentially uh, monitoring all financial activities that happen within uh, the country. So that has issued national guidelines for the issue of the, for the issuance and listing of green bonds. So that is, I think, a big major push to for green bonds in the country. The second part is about blended finance. So uh, what exactly I mean with blended finance is that uh, to give a fillip to all projects that are being done on the ground with regard to solving the energy or the water crisis from the agricultural point of view. So we can think of maybe uh, project finances which the owner or the project owner himself provides and trying and blending it with public or multilateral or bilateral or philanthropic finance in the form of maybe concessional loans with respect to maybe partial risk guarantees, credit risk guarantees, etc. So which improve uh, sorry, which reduce investor risks and then we can see private money is coming in and investing in a big way. So uh, there are... Just to close so that we have at least a couple of minutes of Q&A. Sorry, the sorry. So this is uh, the last... Uh, okay, uh, just the slide before the conclusion. Sorry. So and the last point that I wanted to make was with respect to securitization. So uh, as I said before, these are all small scale and geographically dispersed projects, talking about drip irrigation, off-grid solar, wastewater treatment, to bring them all together to, so that you can have the requisite ticket size and a financial instrument can be designed. So uh, there can be a body which can be in place and a new institution. So it could be existing institutions such as EDATA, NABARD, or uh, uh, EESN, but we can think of a new body which helps bring all of these projects together and get finance going. Uh, finally, uh, the last uh, conclusion, uh, sorry for taking too long. <laughs> this is a very favorite topic of mine and I think, uh, anyways, uh, coming back to the conclusion. So uh, there has been a focus, as I said before, on improving energy market transparency and stability and that to a large extent has a, its bearing on how much finances flow into the markets as well. Uh, the outlook in Riyadh G20 Summit, as far as we observe, it, it has focused on greater grid lines and developing infrastructure that prevents uh, supply disruptions. And our work 
to a large extent is trying to look at this and what could be uh, the innovative energy technologies, how will they be financed, etc. So quality infrastructure is a very important theme for this year's summit. And we are working towards how this can be financed, what sort of infrastructure needs to be put in place. Uh, there are a lot of initiatives that are currently underway with respect to uh, improving the FEW linkages, the food, energy, water, Lexus, and trying to solve the situation. And there is a lot of finance that is being raised as well. But the thing is still that most of the money is coming from public sources and not enough private people are coming in. So that needs to happen. And um, uh, I think innovations, as I said in my previous slide, so some innovations in green finance would help uh, improve the situation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amrita, for again, a very, very rich and comprehensive presentation. Uh, Pranava and Ulka are online, but I'll just ask them for permission for just a couple of minutes where we can have Amrita and Hossa weigh in on some of these issues that have come up in the Q&A box. What I'll try and do is just combine a bunch of these and give them both a minute each to quickly respond. So there's this whole issue around the fact that there is a discontinuous institutional structure, both nationally and internationally, as well as the fact that valuation of some of these losses, as well as gains around food, energy, water are difficult. If I can just ask you to weigh in for less than a minute, perhaps each, starting with Hossa, on how do you think is the best way to go forward with dealing with this, especially in a G20 context? Okay, I was muted. So um, it, is, it is rightly mentioned that um, it is it is very difficult uh, topic and uh, usually governments are uh, working on silos. So especially when you separate uh, energy from food and water. And th that's the, uh, this is the, the whole point of the, having the uh, Nexus idea is to, uh, to look into the uh, uh, an inter um, connection between the three sectors. And in terms of the, um, uh, actually we, are, uh, we have received a couple of um, policy briefs uh, addressing this topic and it's very, very important uh, topic and looking into some recommendations like um, how to share the best practices um, among the G20 countries um, by initiating a forum to, to share the, the practices. And also um, to look into the uh, some some of the uh, the costs associated with using water or des desalination for water, and also how to uh, transfer uh, food into also energy uh, or the w uh, wasted food into energy. And this is one of the policy paper uh, or policy briefs that we received for the task force. Um, I will leave it to uh, Marta to. Uh, to comment in this. Amrita, if I can give you in a minute as well. Yeah, sure. So I also agree with what Madam Almatari talked about. So uh, the I think the answers would be country specific. So in her presentation, if she's talking about desalinization, that probably won't work in an Indian case. But what would definitely work is having some sort of a platform where or a dialogue uh, so that people can exchange knowledge, then can exchange case studies of where it uh, can be sorted out. So that is that sort of exchange needs to happen. The other thing that I'm thinking of is from an institutional point of view. So uh, from an institutional point of view, we already have some institutions that are maybe working well, but because of they being uh, working in silos, lose sight of uh, the core benefits of their actions. So. We would obviously want in some manner to incorporate or to include them in some sort of a larger framework. Um, uh, I don't know how exactly it would happen, but uh, maybe IREDA, if it transforms into a green bank at some point, and it in can take over not only mitigation projects, but adaptation projects as well. So we can see that sort of merger happening. But right now, I don't think too much is happening on this field. Thank you, Amrita. Uh, and thank you also for acknowledging the fact that uh, as important as this energy transition and the common future is, there is a great amount of diversity in terms of where the starting points for each of us are around the world. Uh, I don't think any webinar discussion over the last three or four months 
has ever kind of gone past without referring to the dreaded C word. So let's kind of come back and recognize the world that we are living in. And the reason why we are all doing this virtually across, I don't know how many locations around the world now. Uh, the next session, the question that we are trying to get a sense around is, what happens to the world, especially this energy transition that we're looking at, now that we are living in hopefully a new world order? Uh, the two speakers that we have for this session are Arunaba and Bulka. Starting with Arunaba, Arunaba of the Council on Energy, Environment and Water. He's a pretty widely respected and well-known author, policy analyst, advisor to governments, there's also the fact that uh, his commentaries on in a number of these issues are very widely read and heard around the world, including his uh, famous TED talk. Arnavak, if I can give you the floor for another 10 minutes. Sure. Thank, thank you, Kaushik. And good afternoon to all of you. I'm sorry I couldn't join a little earlier in the webinar. I had a board meeting that I had to wrap up. But uh, I did hear the last part of uh, Dr. Goldar's uh, presentation and I'm looking forward to the conversation going forward. Uh, many thanks for having me in this conversation. Uh, some of the questions that were sent to me, you know, um, are, are, you know, of course, de re do demand some reflection, you know, have we, uh, is the pandemic mimicking a peak fossil fuel demand scenario? Uh, how is it impacting um, energy in developing countries? So let me start from the energy angle first, and then I will get into the broader economy and, and I'll have some reflections on, um, since you are focusing on the G20 as well, I, I, I will want to uh, express some um, reflections on that point as well. From an energy perspective, uh, it was before the pandemic also, it was very clear that energy demand was rising in the emerging economies. It was, the curve was reasonably flat in the advanced economies. Now, since the pandemic, there have been different um, estimations, but this, and that estimation has varied, but um, overall greenhouse gas emissions have, are likely to drop somewhere between, you know, about 6% uh, to the latest numbers from the IEA of about 8% during the course of this year. Uh, now, if it is 8%, then it just about meets the emissions reduction uh, that is needed on an annual basis, according to the UN environment, to, through the course of this decade, to get to a, uh, uh, or rather to keep the uh, temperature rise to within 1.5 degrees Celsius, above pre-industrial levels. So even a global lockdown actually does not mimic anything near the kind of energy transition that the world as a whole needs. Second point, before the pandemic, some work that my colleagues at CEW were doing, we found that during the course of this next decade, um, the US, China, EU, and Japan would consume 49% of the available global carbon budget. So the rest of the world put together um, to stay within 1.5 degrees has only 51% left. Right? Um, so these two um, facts, so to speak, they are our points of view, actually present a bigger conundrum before us. That on one hand, we can't, even if we shut down the economy, we can't mimic an energy peaking scenario. And even if we did that, um, it seems that we are still sort of, to use colloquial language, done for. And that done for scenario comes out uh, just a few weeks ago from the government of India's own official climate change assessment. There have been many other uh, assessments from academics, etc. cetera. Uh, but the official assessment from the government suggests that India or South Asia uh, more broadly is going to be hit by climate change far worse than the globe as a whole. Um, whether it's temperature rise in the Himalayan region, which is likely to exceed five degrees, or whether you take sea level rise in the North Indian Ocean, which is going to be 
about two and a half times the global sea, mean sea level rise. So if, I, if you accept this as the broader premise, then the question before us is, is fossil fuel demand going to peak? And is it going to peak sooner than we are expecting? And secondly, where will the rest of the energy demand that needs to be fulfilled come from? Thirdly, will this genuinely take us out of the pandemic uh, induced recession that we are in? Because a policymaker at a strategic level, we can get into the weeds, you know, <laughs> the thinkers like us, uh, uh, analysts like us, but the policymaker or a politician is going to think about these bigger strategic questions. I think uh, it is not a given that the fossil fuel demand peaking is going to be brought forward. I think we will probably see a, a, a V-shaped curve. Um, it might vary in, it, in the time horizons for different emerging economies, but short of a major alternative source of energy supply coming in for particularly transport and hard to evade industrial sectors, I don't see a significant advancement of the fossil fuel peaking. That it will happen, we all have to prepare for it. So then the question is, where will additional energy supply come from, from cleaner energy sources? Um, increasingly, at least country like India has to think about renewables beyond electricity. Um, I, you know, uh, what can clean energy do for other end use sectors of the economy? Um, whether it is electrification of transport, whether it is efficiency in, in, in commercial establishments and buildings, whether it is in small medium enterprises and whether it is in large industrial sectors. Um, and also, let's not forget agriculture. Um, and the biggest thing that will be on, the, on top of mind for a policymaker is will this, whatever options are, are presented before me, is it going to get me out of the uh, recession? And that is what I fear, that all the advancement that was being made, we're going to have a backsliding on it. So very quickly, I know Ulka is going to come in in a few minutes, the way we are thinking about it at CEW is that you have to try and square what is considered an impossible trinity of jobs, growth, and sustainability. And if you actually think about it, many emerging economies or developing countries are likely to have similar priorities. Number one priority will be jobs. And I think this is where the energy transition does have an advantage over traditional energy sectors. If you take India alone, more than 100,000 jobs already created in solar and wind, a workforce of 330,000 people likely with 160 gigawatts of solar and wind in a few years. If you get to 450 gigawatts, we're looking at a workforce of more than 500,000 people. Distributed energy has a higher employment coefficient. So for every four gigawatts of rooftop solar, for instance, we create 50,000 jobs. Sustainable cooling has a potential to create 2 million jobs just in the servicing supply chain. The high, green hydrogen supply chain has a potential to create 1.9 million jobs between now and 2050 in India. Um, there are jobs in the electric mobility space and so forth. So once we begin to think of the jobs hope, suddenly you're not thinking of an energy scenario or an energy transition. You're beginning to think about what matters for the economy and for your political survival. Second, growth. Where will new growth come from? Growth comes from either government spending capital spending from industry or consumer spending. We can announce all sorts of stimulus packages, but actually they are recovery packages or relief packages. They're not really stimulus packages because you're already 10% plus on your fiscal deficit. So government spending is constrained. Consumer spending was down pre-pandemic. It is down even further now. Capital spending from industry is down because industry does not know where the economy is going to go. So everyone's sitting on cash piles, if at all they have any. So the only way to stimulate is you, if you can find new greenfield sectors where government, consumer, and industry will have uh, a almost win-win-win in terms of investing. And that is, again, where the energy transition gives us new opportunity, not just in India, but in other emerging economies as well, because the energy demand curve is rising. Um, and again, the sectors would be very similar to what I was referring to in terms of jobs. We can get into the nitty-gritty uh, in the discussion. But one factor, one example, 
uh, we've calculated that about 4,500 crore, about $650 million um, credit enhancement subsidy over spread over five years. So it's, it's fairly tiny uh, in terms of an annual injection can create about $12 billion of uh, investment flow into the green energy sectors. Um, that's just one example of how, what kind of stimulus you can generate, which then brings me finally to sustainability. Now, I don't think that mere tree hugging will suffice to push sustainability from the margin to the mainstream. Only jobs, only the opportunity for growth and investment and returns on equity will drive that. However, there's one more element of sustainability, and this is where the G20 comes in, and I'll close with that thought. One part of sustainability is what do you do with what new investment that you're putting in? Is it less brown? Is it more green? Is it really green? But the other part of sustainability is what do you do with your legacy infrastructure? Now, this is where the G20 comes in. How? Number one, we need to have broader discussions about the so-called just transition. I don't think any one country can automatically solve for this for the hundreds of thousands and maybe in cases, millions of jobs that still exist in the brown economy. Number two, and even more importantly, the legacy infrastructure or the new green infrastructure is going to get hit very badly by climate risks. Today, vulnerable countries in, you know, not just the small island states, but also vulnerable regions in large developing countries have no insurance cushion against planetary scale shocks. Just to give one example, Wimbledon gets $141 million from pandemic insurance. All of the World Bank IDA countries, all the least developed countries put together, get $130 million from World Bank's pandemic bonds. Right? So we have effectively no insurance cushion against planetary scale shocks. So one proposition I have made in one, in one of my recent writings is that we need a global risk pooling reserve fund. There have been already calls for increasing the IMF's SDR allocation. It is a nominal currency and therefore no new money has to go in. A voluntary allocation of hundreds of billions of dollars of additional IMF FDR towards a risk pooling fund, which pools different types of climatic risks across countries, could potentially lower the risk curve and then pay out when certain thresholds of disasters have been crossed. At least it would create something bigger than the piddly amount of 130 million that about 100 countries have to share. So I think G20 was forged in a financial crisis. It can refine its resonance and its relevance uh, in this new planetary crisis that we're in. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Arunava. Uh, really eloquently argued and as always, very clear. I, I particularly would like to bring to everyone's attention the emphasis on jobs that Arunava talked about. I think more than anything else, more than an energy or an economic crisis, this is a crisis of livelihoods. And you shouldn't forget the human aspect of this entire discussion. Ulka, you're up next. Ulka is the Director of Climate Change at WRI India. She was previously at Perry, has worked at uh, the Ashoka Trust for Research on Eco Ecology and Environment, and has been a specialist with the Asian Development Bank as well. And Great privilege for me to bring in Ulka with an uh, enormous two decades worth experience on climate change and uh, having worked with her also in the past at uh, Terry. Ulka. Thank you, Kaushik. Um, are you able to see my screen and hear me? Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so, Arunava, always a tough act to follow, but I thought that the questions that the, um, uh, that the organizers have shared were very interesting. So I thought, let me try to tackle some of these questions with some data from India, some work that WRI India has done. So um, the first question was, does this pandemic mimic a peak fossil fuel demand scenario? And I agree with what Adunaba said, and I just thought I'd share. The, this is based on a model that WRI India has uh, helped to develop. Uh, it's called the Energy Policy Simulator for India. 
and it's uh, uh, you know it's an open access model it's freely available on the internet for anybody to use and you can see over here this little dip uh, in greenhouse gas emissions as a result of the pandemic and the lockdown so basically if you look at all of india's current policies they're all captured over here as you can see the ndc is very much achievable and if you look at the kinds of projections that have been made for the contraction in the indian economy uh, studies range from 2% to 11% if you take an average of that there would be a little dip in the ghg emissions but then it would continue on a business as, as usual trajectory and this business as usual includes all the climate change policies of the government of india in various sectors uh, so definitely by no means are we mimicking a kind of uh, uh, you know a peak situation the pandemic by itself will not lead to any any uh, you know major impact unless we have further policies uh, the other way of looking at it is that even if you look at for example the blue skies that we were all very thrilled with in india uh, and the outdoor air pollution that came to a standstill as a result of the lockdown but uh, but there was a hidden story to this there was a hidden side to this which is that indoor air pollution increased during the same period and this actually puts at risk uh, children elderly women uh, and so here again uh, by no means are we in an ideal situation um, you know even with stringent uh, stringent measures or uh, you know a harsh economic um, crisis um with that let me move on to the second question that what is the impact of the pandemic on energy in developing countries and again here taking the example of india um if you look at the projected electricity generation mix in india uh, and the arrow there shows you again the negligible impact of the current lockdown and and the economic contraction uh as many as speaker after speaker in today's webinar has said the um uh that india will continue to rely on coal going well into the future but the yellow band also shows you the increasing contribution of solar power so definitely the uh you know there is a greater contribution of the new build energy that is coming in but uh in order to really make the most of this what we need is is a modernized grid and what we need is greater investment in energy storage technologies um the second way of looking at this i mean the first graph showed you the supply side but if you look at it in terms of demand side where is the demand coming from the blue band is buildings was so buildings means basically residential energy use the gray is industry and these are the two big uh, chunks electricity demand the red is transportation so i had noticed for example in the uh, chat box one of in one of the previous presentations um, an attendee asked about jevons paradox that how even if you have a lot of energy efficiency in the system if consumption continues to rise if demand is not moderated then the total use of a resource in this case of energy would continue to grow it would not it would not come under control so buildings is actually a very classic case of that we have the ecbc policies in india but they really need to be enforced much better and what you do need is behavioral change as this pandemic has shown that we are capable of uh, of drastic behavioral change but that needs to be supported with with policies by itself nothing will happen and with that let me come to the third question which is how can the policy response to the pandemic support energy transition to a net zero world so that's a really um kind of visionary sort of question um so far what we have seen in the global you know various countries recovery packages about a third of the um recovery packages that have been announced so far by different countries about a third of it has relevance to environmental issues so things like agriculture industry waste energy and transportation but if you look at india for example the nobody is really we've not really done this analysis for for covid per se but if you were to conduct a kind of thought experiment if you were to think of an alternative scenario of greenhouse gas emissions for india so the black line is the rising uh, you know business as usual what if you wanted to go towards the green line what if you wanted to in this case also flatten the curve uh, it would take a whole bunch of different types of measures some of those would pay for themselves like greater investment in energy efficiency uh, it would just you know make complete economic sense but some of them would require things that we have not really explored um, uh, in a, in a very deep way for example you'd need to impose a carbon tax in india 
or you would need to look most, much more seriously at carbon capture utilization and storage. And many of the previous speakers have talked about this, so there is definitely much to learn from each other. Um, so this is, uh, this is a sort of indication of if you're really serious about flattening the emissions curve, then we need to think about some rather drastic measures if we want to actually uh, you know, move towards a net zero transition. Um, but there are benefits. Apart from the climate impact, there are health benefits. So just the same sort of policies would lead to 1 lakh people, 100,000 people in India, their lives saved as a result of the health impacts of reduced air pollution. Another way of looking at it is also in terms of water. So this map shows you where the water stressed areas are in India, the dark red ones are uh, where we are already facing severe water stress. And the black dots are showing where thermal water, uh, thermal power utilities are located. And there has been a, a lot of instances of thermal power plants that are to shut down because of prolonged drought. Uh, and, um, and, and solar power over here uh, also uses water for cleaning, but much less than the kinds of water requirements of thermal power plants. So here also we have norms, we have emission norms, we have water usage norms, we need to comply with those. So let me, you know, with the background of these few examples and some data, let me just try to answer the overarching question that the organizer said, can this pandemic be an accelerator rather than a speed breaker? And I'll talk about three different things. One is that the pandemic has shown us very starkly in India the importance of the informal sector. Uh, this particular picture is taken from the silk reeling industry. These are cottage industries. Uh, this is just outside the city of Bangalore where I live. Um, and again, the, over here, the, the opportunity for reducing greenhouse gas emissions, for using clean energy in small and medium enterprises in India is tremendous. But the capital costs become very, um, very overwhelming bottlenecks for the implementation of, of, these, um, of these sorts of interventions even though, as I said, they pay for themselves. So uh, a, a huge focus on the MSME sector is something that is, that is definitely required in order for this pandemic to kind of catalyze us towards a clean energy transition. Uh, the second story is really from the, the coal sector. And uh, Arunabha has already talked about just transition. Um, Amrita spoke about the task force for climate related financial disclosures. And so there are two kinds of um, trends that are happening over here. One is that there is increasing divestment from coal power projects. So the Japanese banks, which were among the last investors, are also facing tremendous pressure from their investors to divest from coal. Uh, and there is this greater sense through uh, carbon disclosure that, uh, that these kinds of projects are going to be stranded assets. Uh, the other human side of this is that uh, obviously what this means is job losses. Um, but there are good examples of social dialogue. Uh, the government of Spain, for example, has created a just transition fund uh, and entered into an agreement with coal miners unions that when these coal mines are closed, they will invest these funds in the area around the closed mines, either for the restoration of that land or for giving or for supporting small businesses by entrepreneurs who have you know, lost their jobs as a result of the closure of these coal mines. So, uh, so what we definitely need right now is, is greater uh, willingness to engage in social dialogue and to be open to these kinds of longer term impacts. We are placing a lot of our hopes in, in solar power, in, in large scale renewable energy. And here again, there are good ways of doing it and slightly you know, uh, more challenging ways of doing it. And the main problem as with everything in India is that we, um, we uh, have a shortage of land. Uh, we, you know, all of these interventions require land. And when we um, invest in these kinds of large scale solar projects, we have to be sensitive to the displacement of lives, of livelihoods and social networks, as well as the biodiversity implications. So here as well, we need to be conscious of the kinds of new jobs that are being created. I think Arunabha very nicely spoke about the numbers of new jobs that can be created. But, um, but, but we have to be conscious of the fact that the kinds of jobs that may be lost may be salaried jobs, you know, more stable jobs, and the kinds of jobs that are being created are the gig economy jobs or the contractual jobs. Who is able to access these jobs? Who has the ability to upskill themselves? Um, are women able to access training programs? Are the solar parks coming up in different regions than where the coal mines were located? So I think there is a need for greater cooperation and greater solidarity. 
Uh, and that's, that's one of the lessons that I would take away from the pandemic. Thank you very much. I'll end over there. Thank you, Ulka. This is a really interesting set of issues that you kind of brought up. Um, again, just a reminder to all participants, we have a Q&A chat box open and a lot of these questions that are coming up, I'm afraid we won't be able to necessarily answer them during the course of the webinar itself, just the fact that we would run out of time. But uh, let me pick and choose as my moderating privileges uh, and uh, pull one to Aranava. Um, so there is this entire issue both of you kind of referred to around jobs and the fact that uh, transition from fossil fuel to renewables also has implications around what jobs are created, how many jobs are created. I think there's another step to this perhaps that one of the participants has also pointed out that apart from jobs being created around power generation capacity being added, there are also issues around the grid flexibility and the ability of that electricity to be actually delivered as electrons to final consumers. Uh, decentralized electricity is a great example of where that kind of issue is bypassed. But, uh, one, do you have a perspective around what this would mean around job creation for this kind of a transition? And second, the thing I think both of you also kind of talked about and brought up uh, during the session is this whole issue around cooling, which is going to be a big, big chunk of growth in energy consumption. What does this mean for economy, for jobs, and everything else that we perhaps are talking about? Okay, so let me, thanks, Kaushik. Let me go at uh, that question, and then maybe Ulka can also come in. On uh, distributed energy, I think we have to think of it in two ways. One, why do we not build more distributed energy infrastructure? And secondly, if we built it, what would that mean for uh, I won't say just jobs, what does that mean for the social dimension of the energy transition? Because that's also how Ulka ended her presentation. Why we don't uh, build more distributed energy is simply because the legacy infrastructure has its own inertia. Yeah. The trans electricity transformer today is the same as it looked at the time of Nikola Tesla. So uh, there has been no innovation in the electricity transformer. New transformers that are being innovated could be the size of your one digit of your index finger, right? So the question here is not why we are not shifting alone, but what will it take for that shift? Will it be only technological? No. Will it be only worried about uh, you know, grid security? Perhaps even not, because the one thing that the pandemic did mimic, at least in India, is can the grid handle variable renewable electricity? And it did. You know, when the prime minister announced the nine minutes uh, uh, lights out on the 5th of April, the estimation for the power grid was that demand would drop by 17 gigawatts. It actually dropped by 32 gigawatts. And the grid managed it. Of course, in some cases with blackouts in the rural areas, etc., we've got some extensive analysis on that. But the point is the grid is more robust than the grid operators think make it sound as a reason not to do renewables. Um, so the only reason then that it will shift is actually political economy of the social dimension. That if the jobs are not far out in a desert and gig economy jobs as, as, as uh, Ulka was, or contractual jobs as Ulka was referring to, but are part of the community, that you are getting district cooling, district heating, electric vehicle charging and rooftop generation and money being, you know, you're earning revenue as the consumer. It creates a different political economy. And that's why at CW, what we've done is we are working with the distribution companies. What thought of usually as the people who don't want the distributed energy infrastructure, we're showing them, we've created business models for them that they can actually gain more consumers and gain more revenue through this new line of business. And in fact, it's not just abstract. We've got a approval from the electricity regulator in Delhi. And we'll be, if the lockdown had not happened, we would have piloted it out already, but it'll happen in a few months. Coming to cooling then. Um, we are a hot country. <laughs> Climate change will make us even hotter. Um, the India Cooling Action Plan, the first of its kind in the world, estimates uh, an eight-fold increase in cooling demand across sectors. 11-fold increase uh, in residential cooling demand. 
between now and 2038 over the next two decades. Um, so the cooling issue again is linked to broader points that Ulka was also referring to. I'm right now sitting under an air conditioner, but that's because the building design does not allow me, allow for me to do anything else, right? But when we see that the kind of the pandemic is making us rethink or should make us rethink about what does it mean to do housing for all? You know, the homes that are being created on the housing floor right now have internal ambient temperatures of 35 degrees and above. No human is going to be able to survive them. And therefore, no human is going to go and live there. And therefore, there's no running away from the shanty towns we have in our cities. So I think we need a, a completely different way of thinking about passive cooling. Of course, low global warming refrigerants. But this also, there is a huge jobs potential, as I was referring to earlier, on the servicing side of cooling technologies, where there's, right now we have 200,000 people, it could go up to 2 million people. Let me stop there for now. Thanks, Kashkal. Maybe I'll just a couple of points very quickly. So on the uh, uh, distributed uh, Google renewable stuff, I think sometimes it comes down to very simple business models. Uh, so I'll, I'll give it, I mean, we have some work on uh, hospitals, for example, uh, how hospitals that used um, uh, renewable energy during this time actually used it to run ventilators uh, during the pandemic when otherwise, you know, they would have had electricity cuts. Um, but I'll give the simple example of LPG, which is not strictly speaking renewable energy, but when you look at indoor air pollution that I spoke about, the bottleneck often comes down to something as simple as being able, how much time does it take to get a refill for your LPG cylinder? So I think that last mile connectivity and the right business model for, for making that um, inexpensive and accessible is something that is a problem that can be solved. Um, on the cooling side, I, uh, I think I'd just like to add uh, to what has already been said, that if you look at the projections for India, the, uh, the demand for cooling is coming mainly from personal cars, and you know, households which will go for their second or third air conditioner. Uh, you know, it's not coming from those climate resilient value chains for farmers you know, or, or for uh, you know, vaccination, refrigeration. So I think there again, we need to be very serious about moderating consumption and you know, even, even being willing to look at policy instruments like taxation. That's not that. Thank you, Ulka. Thank you, Arunaba. Uh, I've had the relatively easy job of moderating uh, today's webinar. It's been a privilege listening to these distinguished speakers, really good friends and uh, fantastic uh, panelists. Now what I'll do is I'll pass on the more difficult job of trying to summarize, conclude, and uh, bring this session to an end, by passing this on to Shaun. Sean, you might need to unmute. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you, it was wonderful. I mean, I think we covered a lot of ground. Um, now the formal vote of thanks. Um, so I would like to take this opportunity to thank DFID. Um, ICREA has been engaged with DFID in the UK, India, economic policy and prosperity partnership um, program under the ages of which we have done several studies and the study that in fact Amrita referred to is also part of that, what we are continuing to do. Um, then thank you to of course, uh, Dr. Kasuria and Dr. al uh, and CAPSAT for this wonderful uh, collaboration. We managed to pull it off without too much of a glitch, I think. Uh, thank you to the speakers, uh, particularly Dr. Ghosh, Ulka, uh, Dr. Nora, uh, and uh, Dr. Hossa and Amrita. Uh, Kaushik, you did a quite a good job moderating this session, I think. And finally, the people in CAPSARC and ICRIA who managed to bring, um, thanks to all of them, particularly Imtanan, uh, Faris, uh, Manmeet, and Rajkumar. Um, Thank you to Arpita Mukherjee for uh, coordinating the EPP program under uh, ICRIR, in ICRIR and collaborating, uh, liaising with DFID and DEA at all times. And uh, last but not the least, my team of researchers, particularly Kuntala, who helped, who's part of the paper that I presented. 
uh, look forward to many such more collaborations and wonderful to have you all. And of course, uh, I should not forget to mention the attendees. Thank you for all the questions. We have not been able to answer all of your questions, but uh, some of which uh, we will, uh, if we have your emails, we will get back to you uh, in due course. Thank you all. It, it was a wonderful webinar, I think. Thank you.